So by means of a preface, in the number of times over the last few months and years, in the course of my sermons, I shared stories of interactions I had with cab drivers, Uber drivers, people I sat next to on the plane, and a number of uh, members of our show asked if I could please share the secret of how you can effectively communicate the seven laws of Noah. There is no secret, but here's a couple of tricks that I picked up along the way. I'm doing this for about 30 years now, because when I was a 17-year-old boy, the Rebbe was speaking about doing this very often. In fact, on Lagba Omer of 1987, there was, a, there was a big parade. It was on Sunday. And the high school that I was at, which is called the Yeshiva Ola Torah, got the rights to make a float. So our float, I was in charge of the float with a friend of mine, and our float was about the seven Noahide laws. And when it went by the Rebbe, the Rebbe was very pleased. <laughs> so I've been talking about this for a very, very long time, and I made a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to tell you all the mistakes I made. I won't tell you all the people <laughs> who ended angry at me. But I, I guess you pick up tricks here and there. And so, so here's, the, here, here, here's what I learned by speaking to probably thousands of people by now of what works and what doesn't work and how we can, and I think we should, effectively try to communicate the laws of Noah. So first three points. Point number one. When it comes to mitzvahs in which we have a responsibility to communicate, whether it's a mitzvah like hocheach tochiach es amisecha, that you should rebuke your fellow, or whether it's a mitzvah of v'shinantem levanecha, that we should teach Torah, to every Jew we meet, we should create as many disciples as we could. Or whether it's a mitzvah like teaching the seven Noahide laws, which ultimately is a responsibility, as Maimonides outlines very, very clearly in his codes in Mishnah Torah, that it's our responsibility to do this. There's two general approaches. One approach is I have to do something. So as long as I did my best, I did my part. I'm done. And I don't care if it's going to be accepted, if it won't be accepted. I have to say my piece. So this is about me doing my mitzvah. And invariably, if that's your attitude, you probably won't succeed often because, because A, you won't do a good job, <laughs> and B, the person you're talking to will probably pick up at some point. They don't really care about them or care about your words being efficacious. You just care about getting this over with. So once you finish doing what you have to do, I'm done. I will, I will uh, distinctly always remember watching an older fellow on a plane. It was an LL plane. And I spent most of the night talking to somebody. In the morning, he actually did put on the phone. So I was watching this older fellow, and he just picked up the phone, and he just walked around the plane. He just said, Tfilin, 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 Tfilin. Of course, everybody said no. And he sat down, and he said, okay, I'm like, I guess I did, I did what I have to do. Like, <laughs> the Rebbe says, put on the phone with people. So I offered them, I stood in front, I said, fill it, fill it, fill it. No, oh, okay, fine. He sat down. So, so I, I didn't think that was very effective, and I, and I wasn't surprised that nobody said yes. I would be surprised if somebody said yes, yeah, would have said yes. Of course, everybody said no. Why, should they, why shouldn't they say no? But this guy worked it all night. You know, eventually he did put on film. Before we left the plane, he did put on film because I wasn't trying just to do what I had to do, I was trying to actually get the guy to put on film. So if you want to communicate things by rebuking people, you could just yell and scream at them. They're not going to listen. They're not, they're not going to be interested in hearing what you have to say, but you can feel good that I did my part. I yelled and screamed at them. I'm told, and I don't know if this is true, that there was a group of people from Yerushalayim that is famously, they make these protests to people desecrate Shabbos to protect the sanctity of Shabbat. And, and that they came to the Rebbe to lodge a complaint that his Hasidim do not participate in the rock-throwing events and they don't participate in the demonstrations. And after all, it's an open halacha. It's an open rule in the code of Jewish law. That you have to rebuke. You see somebody violating the Shabbat, you have to say something. You're not allowed to turn the other way. So the Rebbe said, what is the purpose of the mitzvah? And they have to acknowledge that the purpose of the mitzvah is l'machazir olamutav, so that your fellow, your, your peer, will come back to the way of Torah. 
And, and again, I, I was never able to corroborate this, but the Rebbe said something to the effect, tell me, has anybody ever begun to observe Shabbat because of a broken windshield? And uh, they had to admit that, to the best of their knowledge, nobody had started to observe Shabbat because his windows were broken. So the Rebbe said, so the methodology that my Hasidim have undertaken has resulted in many people keeping Shabbat. So the question then becomes, if I have to do my part, if I had to get it off my chest, if I had to yell, if I had to rebuke, if I had to say something, and I don't really care if it's effective or not effective, okay, so you did your part. Or did you? Because really and truly, although you said what you had to say, you didn't get through to anybody. I was in a taxi a few weeks ago, and I started talking to this fellow, and I just want to share with you like, the methodology that I use. And we were going to the Ohel. He's picking her from the airport. And he says, you know, this is familiar. He says, there was a group of French boys in this taxi, he says, a few weeks ago, also going to the same cemetery. <laughs> he says, they also told me something about seven laws and read it off a card, and I had no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> But eventually, when I finished, he said, ah, this jogs my memory. Yes, I heard about this before. So, with no disrespect to these boys, they had this thing. You know, the Rebbe says, you have to talk about Shevet Mitzvah, so we're going to talk about Shevet Mitzvah. But I think you have to talk about it effectively. So that's, that's, that's the, the, like the first general point that I wanted to make. And, and the second general point that I want to make is that if you understand something well, and it makes sense to you, you'll be able to convey it. If it makes no sense to you, or you, you don't really relate to it and connect with it, you're not going to be able to convey it well. The problem for most people is that the seven Noahide laws don't really make sense to them. They've never taken the time to actually think about what these seven laws are. Why seven laws? Why not ten laws? Everybody knows about ten commandments. Why seven laws? And then, and then, of course, another question which people might well ask you is, Okay, if there's seven laws, where does it say anything about the seven laws? Well, it actually doesn't say anything about the seven laws. There are ten commandments in the Torah that are, that are written as Aseret HaDibrot, mistranslated as ten commandments. There are no seven laws. Where does it say? Where did that come from? How come we don't know about it? How come nobody talks about it? So you, you have to know. You have to know what the seven laws are. You have to understand their history, their backing. You have to understand where, in what direction it goes. And after you understand those things well yourself... I think you're in a much better position to be able to communicate it or share it with somebody else. And, and the third thing is that in addition to the notion that you want to convey this well, in addition to the notion that you have to actually understand what you're talking about, you need to communicate with people. This is, it's not just about communicating the details or the technicalities of seven Noahide laws. You need to connect to somebody. When you connect with people and there's a dialogue, when, the, when, there's, when, you ha when you build say things, it's possible to effectively share things. But we just, it's monologuing. You're just like kind of throwing things at somebody. Invariably, they will not absorb it. They will not retain it. And, and you're kind of wasting your time. Anyway, so, so let's begin from the beginning. There are seven Noahide laws, yes? Seven Noahide laws. Wh where, where does it say anything about seven Noahide laws? Chapter and verse. Where does the Torah say? Where does God say do this? He really doesn't. We have an open verse that speaks about Noah being allowed to kill animals. And we have a verse that says that Adam and Chava should be eating vegetation. But where does it say you have to believe in God? Where does it say you can't worship idols? Where does it say something like, like uh, you can't blaspheme? It, it hardly even says you can't murder. It, it does say that, but it, ha it hardly even says that. And it's not written in a systematic system. Where do the seven Noahide laws come from? How do we know what they are? And so I want to first clarify what the seven Noahide laws are so you should understand it well. A little bit different from the order I said before. After you understand these well, I want to try to tell you about how I think you can effectively convey them based on my mistakes and my experience. And then lastly... I'll talk to you about, you know, effectively building a communication with somebody. So, so let, let's, let's, let's start from the beginning. When we talk about Torah, we're not only talking about Scripture. It's very important to understand. 
Torah, which is God's communication to humanity, is not just about Scripture. In fact, Scripture doesn't show up for a very long time. Scripture, or Tanakh, or Bible, doesn't show up until the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. Until Moshe Rabbeinu is 80 years old. So what happened for the first 2,000 and, and plus years? Was there Torah study? There was Torah study. It says, Our ancestors never stopped studying. Was there people who had knowledge? Yeah. There was a yeshiva called Shem Ve'ever. We have a story about Yaakov going to study Torah. What was he studying? We have a medrash that talks about Avram, you know, going to study from none other than Noah himself. Clearly, Torah is not necessarily scripture. So the, what kind of Torah is it then? This is called Torah Shabal Peh. This is called the oral Torah. Because it wasn't conveyed in a very finite and exact carefully constructed series of carefully constructed verses it was conveyed to us ideas ideas were given godly ideas were given to humanity when did God first communicate with humanity when did he first tell humanity what he expected of them the answer is on the day they were created what did he tell Adam and Chava eat whatever you want any kind of vegetation he said don't eat this fruit don't eat from this tree they ate from the tree. Hashem is not pleased. Why is God not pleased? Because they disobeyed Him. Because He told them what to do. And they didn't listen. And then, ten generations later, we hear of Noah. And Noah lives in a generation that's punished. Why are they punished? Because they didn't follow. When did God say? Who did God talk to? So when you're talking about a, f a generation that was destroyed in a flood, you're talking about God punishing millions of people. How could God punish people if He didn't tell them what He wanted from them? The Torah opens with a narrative of God saying, Mikol eitzagon toichelu, all you can eat, whenever, anything you want from, from this garden, but don't eat from that tree. And then they eat from that tree and God punishes them. I mean, that's kind of logical. It makes sense. And here we find the whole of humanity punished. And they're punished because presumably they did the wrong thing. But God never told them what was right. So what's the obvious conclusion you have to come to? God had to have told them what was right and wrong. If He had expectations of humanity to live a certain way, if he punished humanity because he didn't live a certain way, it's self-understood that he had to have conveyed what he expected from them. Now exactly how the Gemara extrapolates what the seven Noahide laws are and which verses are used for the exorcist so we can understand exactly what Hashem wanted, I think is beyond this, this, this class right now. That's, that's not the point. This is not an in-depth class in the seven Noahide laws. It's not important, this, uh, so important right now how we got there. The important thing is for you to know and understand that Hashem had to have conveyed to humanity His expectations. Because if He didn't convey His expectations, then how in heaven could He punish them? It just doesn't make any sense. So we have this notion that there's an oral tradition. And in the oral tradition, God conveyed to humanity what He expected of them. Why is it not written? Why doesn't it show up in Scripture? It's a good question. But it doesn't mean you come to the conclusion that it's not part of the Torah. There are answers for this. The point, though, is Hashem had to have conveyed to humanity what He expected of them. If God says, I only see Noah as a righteous person, then obviously these laws were not given to Noah after the flood or after the mass genocidal the flood waters. It had to have been given to Adam and Chava. So why do we call them Noahide laws? Because there are seven in total. And the seventh wasn't applicable in the time of Adam and Chava. Because Adam and Chava, there was no eating of meat. Or at least no killing of animals. Maybe roadkill, yes. No killing of animals. Noah is the first one who's permitted to kill animals. And because Noah is permitted to kill animals, he gets specific instructions about how he has to kill an animal. So from this, 
we end up calling them the seven Noahide laws because ultimately it was through Noah that the seven laws were completed. A. B. All of humanity is called B'nai Noah. So since all of humanity is called B'nai Noah, and since the mitzvahs are binding on all of humanity, that's called mitzvahs B'nai Noah. The mitzvahs of citizens of the world, members of the human race. If you're a member of the human family, you're responsible to keep the seven Noahide laws. If you're a gorilla, you're not responsible. Now, gorillas have some intelligence, and they're capable of doing some extraordinary things, but they're not human beings. Even science, which chooses not to see the human being as created uniquely by Hashem, still calls the human being the homo sapien. Why? Because only the human being has the ability to understand right from wrong, can live ethically, can do what is objectively correct, even though it's not enjoyable, fun, or edifying for me. The animal only knows what feeds it. If it feeds it, it's good. If it doesn't feed it, it's not good. Or if its nature is to be giving, then that's its nature. Where human beings are expected to go against their nature, human beings are expected to rise above selfishness and to be selfless. That takes intelligence. That takes wisdom. That takes sapience. So the homo sapien is the only one who's responsible to keep seven Noahide laws. And the seven Noahide laws are therefore binding on all B'nai Noach. We, the Jewish people, are called B'nai Yisrael. So B'nai Yisrael have special mitzvahs. We have many more mitzvahs, many more obligations. Those obligations do not apply to B'nai Noach. But these mitzvahs apply to all B'nai Noach. So that's number one. Just a basic understanding of how Sheva mitzvahs B'nai Noach come. Point number two. So if God prescribes seven basic laws for humanity at the very dawn of creation, and that these are later taught to Moshe Rabbeinu in the Torah, and I will emphasize to you that for B'nai Yisrael and for B'nai Noach, Matan Torah is a watershed point. Why? Like the Rambam says in his commentary in Mesechet Chulim, in Peregid Hanosha, the Rambam explains that even though the prohibition of eating the hindquarters of the animal, the sciatic nerve, is something that was already conveyed, already spoken of in the Torah to the children of Yaakov, we don't do it because God told Yaakov or told Yaakov's children. We do it because God told Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai. In other words, the responsibility for our moral code our obligation that we're under comes from Matan Torah. And included in that obligation are mitzvahs that God even commanded before. Most famously, Brit Milah. So the covenant with Hashem that's applicable on the flesh of a Jewish male known as circumcision, that is something that God told Avraham Avinu. That's something that God told the, the Avram to, to, to do to all the members of his household. It's something that the patriarch subsequently observed. It's something that Moshe Rabbeinu observes. And we read about it in the Torah. Yet, the reason that we perform this mitzvah of Brit Milah is because God says in his Torah, Bayom Hashmini, Yimo Basar Lato, because it says so in Leviticus, not because it says so in Genesis. Now, these seven Noahide laws have been binding for all the nations ever since when. However, they are supposed to keep these laws because God gave them through us, the Jewish people, to the whole world at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai is then a watershed event for all of humanity. It's the time God empowers us to be His light unto the nations, which means principally that we're supposed to be the teachers of ethical morality that we're supposed to be the ones who are sharing messages of God consciousness. I remember the Rebbe once saying, talking about the Sheva Mitzvahs, I think it was on a Sukkot, and the Rebbe said, almost speaking to himself, he, first he demonstrated how much this is a part of Judaism, this is part and parcel of, this is Yiddishkeit. And then he said almost to himself, why didn't I speak about this earlier? Because the Rebbe really started speaking about it in the, in the 80s, late 70s. And the Rebbe said, I, I myself can't answer that question. But it doesn't change the facts. And this is what the Torah expects of us. It's possible that once upon a time people were so busy surviving, who could think about influencing? If, if the anti-Semite didn't beat you up, you were happy already. That's the world we lived in, unfortunately. 
But now we could be a source of influence. And people are willing to listen to us. It doesn't mean everybody loves us. It doesn't mean there's no anti-Semitism. I'll tell you this. The best antidote to anti-Semitism is the seven no laws. Because when you connect with somebody and you share with him a message of morality and a message of decency and a message of spirituality and a message of God consciousness, and if he connects with you, and I think oftentimes we really can connect, why should he hate you? <laughs> like, all you do is give him something meaningful to chew on. People are appreciative. And ultimately, if we, the more we do our destiny, the more we do what we're supposed to do, the more we'll be accepted. It's not the cause of anti-Semitism. By, by coming to an anti-Semite and educating him about the horrors of World War II and about how bad anti-Semites are, you're not necessarily going to change him from who he is. You'll maybe make him ashamed to voice his anti-Semitism publicly, to share with him a message of inspiration, to inspire him, to show him that he, too, is created in God's image and that he, too, has an opportunity to cultivate and nurture a meaningful relationship with God. You know what happens? He says, that's pretty cool. It was taught to me by a, this Jewish man or woman. So that's, that's very nice. Why should I hate you? So, this, these mitzvahs are given to us by God and specifically given to us, the Jewish people, with the responsibility to teach it to all the peoples we come in contact with. These, are, these principles will be challenged, have been challenged time and again. There have always been societies that embraced certain elements of these principles and rejected others. Always. And I have a hunch there always will be. But these principles don't change. Whether the society we live in frowns on one thing or another, that's fine. That doesn't change us. We are not pre prepared to define ourselves by virtue of the vicissitudes of time or uh, how geography or anthropology changes. We define ourselves by the timeless connection we have with Hashem and the timeless nature of the mitzvahs. So let's move on to actually talking about the Sheva Mitzvahs. Trying, let, me, let me show you how much sense they make. When you see how much sense they make, how they follow a very, very specific order, you, I think you'll have a much better ability to convey it. Okay, so the first thing is, six of the Sheva Mitzvahs, if you want to get very technical, are actually couched in negative terminology. They're more like don'ts than do's. So for example, the first mitzvah is, you shall not worship idols. That's the way the mitzvah is couched. The mitzvah is couched in negative terms. However, the document that I distributed to today is based on a document that was once on the Rebbe's desk. And I don't know what the Rebbe did choose or didn't change, but the, 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 the one change that, I, that was even before I modified this document is that all these negatives have accompanying positives. So if you want to say to somebody, don't worship idols, what obviously does there have to be? What's necessary if we're not going to worship idols? What does there have to be? Who they should worship. <laughs> so who should, exactly, who should you worship? Then you have to believe in God. It's only that the Torah couches it in negative terminology. The belief in God is somehow considered to be inherent. It says, channel that belief appropriately. There was a poll that was released by a very, very anti religious news agency. I don't remember if it was the CNN or BBC. That's my opinion of these news agencies. I think they're anti-faith. And the poll said something. I'm entitled to my opinion, right? That's, the poll said something to uh, the, the tune of 94% of the world's population believes in God. 94%. That's an incredible number. That doesn't mean 94% will claim to be religious or subscribe to a particular religion or necessarily comport themselves in accordance with any particular religious faith system. But it does mean that 94% of respondents said they believe in a creator. They believe in a superpower. They believe in a God. 94%. Even if it's 10 points off, even if it's 84%, it's still an overwhelming number. So how is it that the one thing that has persisted in every society is belief in God? And how is it that in societies where there was, let's say, a push away from faith in God, there was ultimately A, pushback, and B, it was done with so much angst, so much anger, so much emotion. Why is something that doesn't exist altogether 
getting so much attention. <laughs> you know, like uh, in the theory of random evolution, that nothing was created purposefully, everything just happened to evolve. So how did we end up with certain things? The answer is survival. The, the sexual urge, for example, is attributed to the need for people to survive or perpetuate themselves. So that's why that urge developed. So then the obvious question is, so how is it that over the sands of time and the various uh, vicissitudes of, 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 of reality, how is it that faith has still remained with human beings? Like what, what exactly was it good for? What did it do for people? How, how did it survive? Because the things that weren't needed, supposedly, they just fell away. We supposedly once had a tail, but we didn't have needs for tails, so the tail fell away. Something like that. How does faith survive? <laughs> so one atheist told me, we consider it a spandrel. A spandrel is when you build a house and there's sometimes dead space beneath the staircase. So who designed this house? How would you have to? Well, it's invariably, you're going to have some dead space. So it's an accident. The fact that so many people believe in God is an accident. It's not logical. It's not logical that somebody should be, be gravitating towards faith in God. What has religion offered? It's not opium. Call it opium of the masses, but it's not opium. Opium is opium, and hallucinogenics are hallucinogenics, and religion is not that. What has it given people that they keep coming back to it? Forget real religion, fake religion, worship of idols, worship of the true God. Why do people look for faith altogether? The answer, my dear friends, from a Torah perspective, is that we believe in God because there is a God. That's why we believe in God, because it's true. And because our soul is a piece of God. And because our soul is a piece of God, that's why we believe in God. So invariably, we will always gravitate back to belief. It's part of who we are. It's part of our makeup. People will say to you, seeing is believing. I mean, seeing is believing? But what's seeing? If seeing is believing. I thought seeing is seeing. We touch with our hands. We see with our eyes. We hear with our ears. We smell aroma with our nose. We taste with our taste buds or our mouths. We grasp ideas with our mind. We empathize with our heart. And we connect spiritually with our souls. And the spiritual connection which can express itself in a variety of different manifestations like certitude, confidence, comfort, a drive, a need a mission, for mission and purpose. All of these things, those are the language of the soul. So faith or belief is the language of the soul. In a certain way, for somebody to believe in God is not considered to be a feat. It's almost innate. It's like you don't get a gold medal for walking on two feet if you're human. It's expected you'll walk on two feet. It's expected you'll gravitate towards faith. It's expected you'll put your faith in something that is higher than you, in something that is greater than you. And in fact, everybody does. Everybody believes in something. Nobody doesn't believe in anything. I was once speaking to an atheist, and he said to me, so-called atheist, he said to me, everybody has to believe in something. I said, you know what I'm saying? He says, you have to believe in something. So I believe in secular ideals. I said, well put. Because the things you believe in don't actually make sense. You know that. He says, I know, I know. But I believe. That's my, my, my belief system. That is the meaning of do not worship idols. Every one of us has a natural connection to God. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to nurture that natural connection with God and direct it appropriately. Don't worship other things. Don't choose to create idols. Idols don't necessarily mean statues of gold, silver, of stone or wood. That's not what an idol is necessarily. That's an example of a, a kind of idol. That's, that's, that's an object when you, an, 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 an you take idolatry and it's objectified. So you worship an object. It's not any less idolatrous if a person worships a, worships a mountain, if a person, person pardon me, worships a planet, or if a person is worshiping an ideology. If that ideology is an ideology that is, is, stands 
so to speak, on a, in a higher plateau. It's even if I don't agree, even if I can't understand, even if I don't like, I'm just going to bow my head in submission because that's the ideology. It has to be right. That's a form of idolatry. I mean, think of it this way. Communism claimed to want to free, to liberate humanity from all of its ills. The bourgeois and the people who want to take everybody's money and the people who are selfish and the capitalists and so on and so forth. What did communism actually do? It destroyed people's lives. It was the singular reason for the murder of millions. That's not a theory. That's a well-documented fact. So how did people who had belief in this higher ideal feel comfortable killing people to attain their ideal? Because that was their idol. It was a godless idol. Whether the idol was Lenin or Stalin, Yemachshimam. Whether the idol was a person, or the idol was an ideology, or the idol was a vision, but it became an idol. Which means, you talk about human sacrifices? You don't have to go to antiquity. Human sacrifices, what happened in the Soviet Union, those were human sacrifices. Those were people who were brought on the altar of this monstrous idol called communism which was a monstrous idol, which destroyed lives and people and families and ultimately their country. For what? For an ideology. That's an idol. When people talk about, uh, you know, religion is good. Religion is good, not, not good or bad. Religion means that you're going to live a, a life that's infused with faith in something. And faith invariably is going to infuse whatever it is you're doing with a passion, with a fervor, with a dedication and devotion that faithlessness will never be able to compete with. So if you believe in bad things and you believe in them with religious fervor, it will be that much worse. Like, like I sometimes say to people that religion is a great, a great elixir. It's like steroids. If you're doing good things, but you're doing them because it's an act of faith, you'll do them so much better. In, in, in simple terms, the atheist community has never produced a Mother Teresa. Nor will they. Why should they? Why should somebody live in such a kind fashion? Why should somebody be so giving? Why should somebody be so self-effacing if I worship myself? But if I worship something higher, it doesn't matter if I, 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 we agree or don't agree, buy into a faith system or don't buy into a faith system. The notion that somebody would do something good because of his or her faith means they will do something in, in a remarkable way because there's something higher than them that beckons. And if they'll do something bad, it'll be that much worse. So the selfish individual who murders just because they're selfish, because they're a thief, because they're looking for profit, they're looking for, for some kind of self-advancement, and they're ready to climb over as many dead bodies as it takes. They're very evil. But the person who kills in the name of an ideology or of a faith-driven vision is that much more of a monster. And again, these are not theories. This is something that we're seeing, unfortunately and tragically, in the world that we live today. If there's a fascist ideology... That fascist ideology preaches that everybody has to be dominated and subdued. Everybody has to be made low. Everybody has to be, so to speak, uh, brought into submission because this fascist ideology believes that it should be controlling the world by force and by power and its adherents are so consumed with this fervor that they have for that faith system then they will be even worse than the communists. The communists and the Nazis are ready to kill your children. These people are ready to kill their own children. It's that much more demented. And that can only happen when faith gets involved. So faith, faith is a very powerful thing, but to say that all religions are the same is to say uh, a spouse and a prostitute are the same because they both employ sexuality, which is ridiculous. <laughs> because somebody believes in an idol or in a, in, a, in, a, in a false god or false ideology and somebody worships the true God and the Torah... You can't say, well, it's basically the same. It's both religion. It's, it's not basically the same. If here's somebody who seeks prostitution, here's somebody who seeks marriage. It's not basically the same. In fact, they couldn't be further apart. Even if they use some of the same methodology. Even if they use some of the same mechanics. So the first commandment that Hashem gives us, when He says to, to believe in God, 
What's expected of humanity is not to redirect the natural inclination that we have towards God in an in unwholesome, unhealthy fashion, to create false gods. So what did the Rebbe propose for, for public school children when there was an uptick of violence? We're just seeing now where this was all leading. The Rebbe was talking about this 40 years ago, about if a child doesn't, isn't told about God and if a child doesn't think about God, the world will become a jungle and everybody will do as he or she pleases. Nobody knew what the Rebbe was talking about. Now all these mass shootings are happening. This is exactly what the Rebbe was talking about. The Rebbe foresaw this 40 years ago. What was the Rebbe's answer? The Rebbe's answer is that the day in school should begin with a moment of silence. Not anybody telling you what to think about. Talk to your parents. It's the right of parents to educate their children. It's a free country, freedom of religion. Parents can educate their children as they see fit. No teacher should be telling the child, this is the religion you should worship, this is the way you should think about God. But let the child just take the time to think that there is a creator who created him or her and all of the rest of us, a creator before whom you will someday have to give a reckoning for how you did or didn't lead your life, and that it isn't just one big world of random happenings. Why shouldn't somebody be violent if all he's being taught his whole life is that a human being is just a mindless, meaningless collection or of atoms and protons and neutrons that happen to attach themselves a certain way? That there's no meaning to creation. That all of it is a big accident. Why shouldn't somebody do things which are self-serving? Why should somebody be selfless? Why should somebody contain and restrain their urges, their cravings, their, their negative feelings? Why should they? So the first mitzvah is don't worship idols. Obviously a recognition of a supreme being. The problem is that people have replaced worship of God with foreign gods. And worst of all is this self-worship. Self-worship is the most toxic form of idolatry. Communism or atheism is actually idolatry. Only you worship yourself. You worship what's good for you, or what you think is right or wrong. Does that make sense? This makes sense. Makes sense, okay. So if that makes sense, if we accept it, what's the next thing? What's the next step? So, okay, I believe in God. I'm not going to worship idols. So well, the problem now is that it's, it's not enough only not to channel your faith or your belief appropriately. A person also has to be careful that they're not going to be disrespectful. I'll give you a simple example. And I share this with people all the time, and, and I, I find that it resonates. People do understand it. You don't have to tell a normal husband or wife, you should respect your spouse. You should treat your spouse respectfully. You don't have to say, you don't have to say that. It should be understood. You should respect everybody. Of course, you, res you should respect your spouse. But when you have to warn about negative behavior, what would you say? Say, how, how dare you disrespect? How, I mean, how could you do such a, something like that? That's totally inappropriate. In other words, sometimes it's not the positive act of respect that's easiest to talk about. Sometimes it's easier to talk about disrespect. So do not, don't disrespect. You'll find your way to respect, but don't disrespect. So when we say that we should, we should respect the Creator, which means not to blaspheme, that means that in our relationship with God, the relationship can't be, yes, I believe there's a God, and therefore I blame God for all the problems of the world. So my relationship with God is that I'm angry at God. There's a beautiful story that Rabbi Chatzkel Sofer tells, or at least they tell it in his name, that he used to give a class in the University of Be'er Sheva where he was stationed doing Chabad work, and there was one professor who never came. And he once bumped into the professor somewhere in the hall and he said to the professor, how come you don't come to any of the classes? And the professor said, well, because I don't believe in God. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I don't believe. There was no God. There's no God in Auschwitz. I don't believe in God. In fact, he said, I eat pork every Shabbat. So Rabbi Chaskel Sofer said, tell me, you eat pork every Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, or only on Shabbat? He says, no, only on Shabbat. So Rabbi Sofer said, you're not an atheist. 
you believe very strongly in God. You're just angry at him. <laughs> if you eat pork only on Shabbat, you clearly identify that there's like, you're angering somebody. You're, you're expressing your frustration. How dare he? Okay, so how dare he? So you're eating. You're not an atheist. You're an angry, angry person. So we have just to have, it's not enough to have a relationship with God, we have to have a respectful relationship with God. And a respectful relationship with God, in the Torah, the way the Torah captures it is, do not blaspheme. That we're not allowed to curse God. And if we disrespect God, then we are tampering with or damaging the very intrinsic relation that God put in place. The closer we are with somebody, the more egregious the disrespect will be. If a husband publicly shames his wife or vice versa, it's much worse than a stranger publicly shaming because you violated our trust. How could you do that to me? How could you embarrass me and shame me? How could you attack me in public? When we blaspheme chas or we, 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 so to speak, campaign against God or speak against God, it's not a sign that we don't believe in God. It's a sign that we're fighting with God, angry with God. And people did this right in the very beginning, even after the Great Flood. They wanted to fight God. So the notion that we have to believe in God is not, it's not enough not to worship idols. It's that, that the relationship with God has to be punctuated with respect. And ultimately, if one respects God as the Creator, invariably, where will that lead us? It leads us to be respectful of creation. If I respect God because He's the Creator, I respect every human being because he or she is created in the image of God. God says so. God says we're created in His image. Nowhere in the Torah does it say that the image of God is one color or another color, one society or another society, one anthropology or another anthropology. Humanity, all of humanity, regardless of race, creed, color, every human being is created in God's image. If a human being is created in God's image and you respect the Creator, it naturally follows that you will be respectful towards people. How could you not be respectful towards people? It even means we're respectful towards human remains. We understand there's something unique and special and different about people. Incidentally, one of the idols that's worshipped today is the idol of human rights or the idol of the importance of humanity. But then again, stop and ask yourself the question, where did we get that from? What makes a human life more sacred than the life of a kangaroo? Why are the, almost all people sickened at the thought of cannibalism? But even if they're angry about somebody eating meat, they're not sickened in the same way. Who made that difference? Is it just artificial? People just decided this arbitrarily? All civilizations, all societies, everybody happened to come up with the same idea? Incidentally, all societies from every time and in every place, have always had some kind of religion, some kind of faith system. Whether we talk about the aboriginals of North America, of Middle America, South America, people who had nothing to do with those living across the ocean. From the Far East to the Far North to the Far South, everywhere where people were, there have always been some kind of faith and some kind of faith leaders. There's always been a talk of a shaman, a spirit, a force, Always. How did everybody come with that idea together? Unless we all came from the same place. Or unless this is inherent to who we are as human beings. So it's inherent to believe in God. What's unfortunate is to channel that natural and organic belief in a bad direction. It's inherent, or it should be inherent for us, not only to believe in God, but we have to now work on ensuring that the belief we have in God, the feeling that there is a God, has to be something we respond to with respect. As one colleague of mine once, once said, he said to me, there's no placid or ambivalent atheists. They're all angry. Why are they angry? What are they angry about? And they'll answer you, because you believe in mumbo-jumbo. Does it bother you if I believe in the tooth fairy? That somehow a tooth fairy does not engender that kind of anger. What do you care what I believe in? Why does it bother you if I... Religion is the source of all evil. Did I bother you? Did I do anything to you? <laughs> like, what? The source of all evil? Hitler was an atheist. Stalin was an atheist. Pol Pot was an atheist. Mao Zedong is an atheist. I could go on. 100 million people slaughtered on the altar of the idol called communism or socialism, national socialism, from the right to the left. There was no religion that motivated those heinous 
horrible murders and, and, and acts. So religion can't be the problem. So why does religion make you so angry? And the answer is the second commandment. That's blasphemy. People say deep down they know there's a God and they're not even ready to worship anything else, but they're angry at God and they want to disrespect God. And when people will disrespect God, eventually they will disrespect human beings and human rights too. And they have to go no further than communism. They disrespected God and in the end, they had the highest and the greatest disrespect and disregard for human beings and human rights. And this means, of course, not to hurt other people's feelings. Because even though feelings aren't tangible, it's not like a bloody nose, it's not like broken bones, but somebody's spirit that's damaged and somebody's feelings that are hurt, ultimately it also is a degradation of a, of a human being. It's robbing them of their dignity. It's disrespect. Where does that come from? This is the idea of do not blaspheme. It all comes from, it starts with being respectful towards God. It extends to being respectful towards everything and all those created in God's image. And ultimately from there, it comes to being respectful for the environment and for the world that God created. Because if God didn't create any junk, God created everything for a purpose and a meaning, don't live a disrespectful life. Don't live a life of blasphemy. But the funny thing is, these ideas and isms that people worship today like human rights, like the environment, like taking care of the, the globe, they're really all rooted in this idea of blasphemy. If we would have respect for God, invariably we would have to necessarily respect all of his creatures, all of creation. So it makes sense. The commandment makes sense. It just makes good sense. And which takes us now into the next detail. It's not just enough to, to respect God and not to blaspheme. But ultimately, the Torah says do not murder. But what is do not murder based on? It's a negative. Don't kill. What is don't kill based on? It's rooted in the notion that there is a sanctity to human life. Human life is sacred. So people who will say, I break for elephants. Or they'll say, I, you know, pita, you, you, you're the holocaust on a plate when you have a steak dinner. Or whatever kinds of ridiculous things they'll throw at you. At the end of the day, they're quite comfortable killing cockroaches. But cockroaches are also people. Well, if a cow is a person, why isn't a cockroach a person? Why isn't a rodent a person? It's, it's, it's alive. Cockroaches don't suffer. Only cows suffer. Even for people who consider it horrible to kill a dog, they're still uncomfortable killing an animal like a dog a cat, a kangaroo, but they're okay when a mouse gets killed. You have no problem putting mice trap up. How about bees? Bee traps? Mosquitoes? Spraying them with off? They're all, they're all living creatures. So the truth is that there may be levels, there may be levels of life. There's inanimate life, and then there's animated or vegetative life, and then there's animal life. There are different levels of life. The term murder cannot apply to dogs, to cats, to kangaroos, to chimpanzees. The term murder can only apply to human beings, or so it should be. It's all killed. The word kill, you can use the word kill. You kill a cockroach. You kill the mouse. You kill the mosquito. You did kill him. He was alive till you killed him. It doesn't make you a murderer. When you take human life, it makes you a murderer. Why? Because human life is sacred. Where does that come from? Where does it come from that human life is sacred? If not from the Torah, if not from God, who legislated to us that human life is sacred. And human life, once again, has always been considered sacred. In virtually all civilizations and societies, human life was deemed sacred. And to take a human life as an act of murder, plain and simple. So ultimately, when we talk about the transcendental quality of human life, it's not a scientific thing, because from a scientific perspective, we could argue that there are various forms of life which are alive, which are ended at a certain point. The bottom line is that human life is human life, whether or not there is significant cognition or no cognition. 
whether a person is highly intelligent or extremely unintelligent. If you kill a person who is severely retarded, what they call mongoloid, you're still a murderer. That's still an act of murder. And this takes us down a, a very, very fraught and controversial, but very clear subject, and that's the subject of abortion. The subject of abortion, like the notion that a baby has no rights, that it's not a human life. So we talk about human rights, and we defend human rights, but at the same time, we have no problem killing babies. It actually makes no sense. Now, the Torah itself draws a distinction between an unborn fetus and a born fetus. And I'll give you the simplest example. I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago in Shul. If there is a woman in labor and the baby threatens her life, the woman will die because of this baby, then the halacha is we have to kill the baby and save the mother. Because we say he's a roidif. He has the halacha of somebody who's trying to kill somebody. And if one person is trying to kill another, the moral thing to do is to kill the person who is a would-be murderer. However, once the head appears, what they call crowning, we have no right to intervene. But he's still a roidif. He's still the one getting born. He's still killing his mother. We cannot play God and decide which human being gets to live and which human being doesn't get to live. If one of them is baleful and has murderous intent, we have a moral obligation to eliminate the murderer. But here we have two human beings, and there's a situation that's orchestrated by forces that are beyond our purview and power, and they're both on the same level of human life. So to take that life would be immoral. Simply wrong. I have a, a second cousin, a famous radio host, syndicated radio host. His name is Dennis Prager. And he has this great line to convey in 30 seconds the notion of morality and sanctity of human life. He says, if your best dog, the dog you love, and the person you hate fall off a rowboat at the same time, you can only save one, who would you save? Most people will lie and say the person. Most people tragically <laughs> would save the animal. What's the moral thing to do? Not the intuitive thing to do not the thing that feels good. The, the moral thing to do is to save the human because the human life is sacred and in as much as we may love our dogs, they're still not people. And we cannot blur the distinction that the Torah puts between animal life and between human life. May I put my dog down? I've been asked. Yes, you may. You may. Very moral people, Western people, ethical people will put their dog down because the dog is suffering. You're allowed to do that. May I end a human life prematurely? No. It doesn't matter if the Supreme Court of Canada says it's okay. The Torah says it's not okay. In Arizona, prostitution is legal. So therefore, if I'm a rabbi in Arizona, I have to go along with that? <laughs> I, tell, I still say it's wrong. So the Torah is very explicit in telling us that human life is sacred. And, 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 if, and developing human life is also sacred. It, it, it boggles my mind how Scott Peterson got a double life sentence for killing his wife and the unborn baby. Right? There was Lacey and Connor. But how could the same society, the same state that presides over and pays for tens of thousands of abortions a year convict somebody of murder because the mother didn't want the baby to die? I and mean, he's a horrible guy, Scott Peterson. He's a monster. He killed his wife. He's a murderer. He deserves the electric chair, which I think he's getting. But how could you convict him for the murder of an unborn baby when he killed an unborn baby? He's a murderer. And the person around the corner is considered to be a hero because he killed the unborn baby. Why? Because this one the mother wanted to get rid of and this one the mother didn't want to get rid of? Is that the arbitration? Is that the, that's the mark of distinction between what's right and wrong? What's sanctified, holy or not? It doesn't make sense. Now, if somebody will come to you and make the argument that a person doesn't want to live anymore and a person is frustrated and they're in terrible pain and you're cruel for not putting their life, putting them down. And they're begging you to put them down. I cannot say that that's illogical. I cannot say that they don't have a point, logically speaking. I can say that I believe it's wrong. Why do I believe it's wrong? Because the Torah says it's wrong. <laughs> I, I believe what the Torah says. I'm not telling you that I, it feels good. 
I'm not telling you that I understand it. I'm not telling you I like it necessarily. I'm not telling you I can't empathize with somebody who would have done that. I am telling you that there is a higher morality that comes from a place that transcends rhyme and reason and what our minds grasp or cannot. And that's the notion of do not murder. Now, incidentally, in Judaism, warfare is permitted. And warfare necessarily means killing. But it doesn't mean murder. Because warfare that's permitted is moral warfare, which is called melchemet mitzvah. We are not permitted to wage war for the sake of waging war or kill people for the sake of killing people, heaven forfend. What we are permitted to do is defend ourselves. And the Western world intuitively knows this because armies in the Western world are called defense forces. The Canadian army is called the Canadian Defense Forces. Of course, in Israel, it's called the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. A defense force means that we have the obligation and, in fact, the moral imperative to defend our citizens from would-be murderers. It's not holy. We reject the notion of holy war in the strongest of terms. It's the most abhorrent kind of conjunction humanity has ever come up with. Holy war? That's repugnant. It's disgusting. It's abominable. Killing is holy? David HaMelech waged war, moral war, Muhammad Mitzvah. And David HaMelech was told by God, even you, who did the right thing, because you were supposed to do what you did, you can't build a Beit HaMegdash. And he desperately wanted to, and God says, sorry. Why not? Because you are a man of war. And war is not holy. Your son Shlomo, his name is peace. He never ever fought a war. He will build a base on Migdash. The highest ideal from a Torah perspective is peace. But in a time of war, to say, oh, sorry, I make love, not war, when somebody evil or an evil force is right now threatening the rest of the world and innocent people, we have no choice. David HaMelech didn't do the wrong thing. He did the right thing for David HaMelech. And Shlomo HaMelech did the right thing for Shlomo. And the Torah conveys a very powerful message to us by sharing that Shlomo can build a Beit HaMikdash and David cannot. There are moral wars. A soldier does not murder. A soldier in a moral army kills. A murderer murders. A terrorist murders. If a hostage is taken and the police have to use lethal force in order to try to save the hostages. Even if it's police bullets that kill an innocent hostage, who killed the hostage? Not technically, but figuratively. The kidnappers, the terrorists. The police will say, we regret that we killed, not that we murdered. We never murdered. A moral police force can't murder. How can they murder? They may kill. It's just the same way if, God forbid, a doctor makes a mistake on the operating table, and God knows they do, and they cover them up most of the time. But mistakes tragically and terribly happen in hospitals. Ask any doctor who's really going to tell you the truth, and they'll tell you. We call them murderers? Most of those mistakes are made with best of intentions. Mistakes happen. It's tragic. It's tragic. Unfortunately, the doctor's in a, in a, in a position where <laughs> those mistakes are terrible. Awful mistakes. He's still not a murderer. It's a big difference between somebody who killed inadvertently, mistakenly, unwittingly, and a person who chose to snuff out the life of a human being. Murder is the gravest of offenses. And so the Torah, when it talks about sanctity of life, you know, this really addresses a whole range of issues from assisted suicide to abortion to holy war, quote unquote, to, to terrorism to a war on terror, to being able to fight evil. I mean, the last time the world had any kind of clarity, moral clarity, was in World War II. So therefore, for the last 70 years, every time somebody is doing something you don't like, what do the people intuitively call him? A Nazi. Everybody's a Nazi. You never notice that these days? Everybody you don't like? All of your political opponents are Nazis. <laughs> I saw... Recently, a, a clip on Facebook, uh, 
of, of uh, people who were protesting in a university because in university they were having a frank discussion of whether the difference between male and female is intrinsic or artificially imposed. And this woman is saying, well, there are differences in women. She says, she says women store fat differently. Women are, by and large, shorter. Women are, by and large, fairer. And she's going through differences. And these protesters get up to protest the fact that she's saying this, these heretical things. And the, and the police escort them out. And one of the protesters screams, there's no room for Nazis in, in the United States of America. And I'm like, wow. Wow. So this woman said that women are different than men intrinsically and doesn't subscribe to the notion that men are women and women are men are men are women and there's absolutely no difference. She says, well, there are some differences. That's what she said. I saw the clip. So she's a Nazi. And like, I wondered to myself, does this idiot even know what a Nazi is? Does he have a clue what Nazis did? But anyway, that was the last time the world had moral clarity. And it's such a rarity in this Meshuggah world of ours, that this crazy world, that somebody should actually have moral clarity. <laughs> what happened was... The soldiers who fought in, in our Canadian army, for example, or fought in the Allied forces, were understood to have been warriors of righteousness. That doesn't mean the war was holy, but they did the right thing. They were fighting a moral, a just war. They were fighting an evil that was obvious. It was impossible to deny that Hitler wasn't a monster, an evil person. It was impossible to deny it. So... Is that war? Those soldiers? Is that an act of murder? Chas who, v'shalom. Who would say that? You could say that that was an act of killing. Necessary killing. Tragically necessary killing. Whose fault? Hitler's fault. Not Roosevelt's fault. So when we talk about this, this notion of, of sanctity of life, it's important for us to understand that it's not a commandment. This really governs the very workings of human anthropology itself. And where does it all boil down to? It boils down to the notion that human life is sacred because God said it's sacred because we're created in the image of God. So now we've learned that there is a God and we're supposed to believe in Him and we're certainly not supposed to worship anything else. We learned that we're not supposed to blaspheme, which means to respect the Creator and everything else. We learned that human life is sacred. What's the next thing? What is the single most powerful force in, 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 in the human condition? The single most powerful force, the force that has ripped apart families and kingdoms, the force that has driven the oldest profession and that has, is the source of untold industries, human sexuality. Now, it's true that all, all creatures have sexuality, it's also true that all creatures do not have mitzvahs, do not have commandments, are not expected to behave a certain way. It is so telling and compelling to me that virtually every civilization, and I googled this, I, was, I did research because it was fascinating to me, has had some kind of sanctified image of marriage. That there was somebody, whether it was a medicine man or, a, or some kind of... A, August or elevated personality, whether mixed politics and religion, but in every civilization, there is somebody who's involved in the marriage. Somebody blessing a marriage, somebody supervising a marriage, somebody overseeing a marriage, somebody granting a marriage sanctity. And somehow marriages have a lot to do with God. Where'd that come from? From the aboriginals? To Western civilization? To the civilization of the Far East? Everybody came up with the same idea. Why did they come up with the same idea? Has it worked so well? Does it work so well? Does it even make sense that kids in their 20s should make a decision that will implicate them for the next 70 years of their life? Does that make sense? Maybe not. When nobody enters into business relationships like that. They have LLPs, limited partnerships. And they have very, very good contracts that will create the truncation before we even come together. I know there's prenups, fine. But is that what marriage is? Another business arrangement? Why is it that marriage is somehow something that's so powerful, something that's so important to the human condition? No other civilization has marriage besides human civilization. Animals mate, they don't have marriage. They don't have families. So we believe that marriage is a divine thing. 
Now, is it possible for human beings to choose not to marry? Of course it is. Of course, it's a free world. Does that mean it's sacred? No. It means you basically have a choice in life. You can live a profane life of self-gratification, or you can live a sacred life of loyalty and devotion to Hashem. It's your choice. It's your choice. You can live in whichever which way you choose to live. But we believe that there is a choice to be made. And that the notion of marriage being sacred is a divinely ordained idea. And that means everything from societies that encourage or condone unbridled sexual activity and behavior is not healthy. All civilizations that did this eventually were destroyed in their prime, most of them. Think of ancient Greece. When we have excessive permissiveness, it basically undermines ultimately the very bedrock of human civilization and society. Everything becomes rotten to the core. So we, as Torah Jews, believe that there is a sacred code of sexual conduct. And that's called marriage. And that marriage has to be respected. And that marriage has a, a, a partnership as if with God, so to speak. Let me put it to you this way. There's a new idea in the Western world today called open marriages. So open marriages mean we're married on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Thursday, we do as we please. We'll get together again for the weekend. But they both agree. Or sometimes they're, they're very open. Husband will say to wife, I met this nice girl. I'm going to you know, have a little tryst, okay? She said, no problem. Yeah, I met a nice guy too. She says, oh yeah, I'm ready. I'm happy to loan you out. You, you have a good time. See you later. I love you, so I care about you. I want you to have a good time. It's kind of self-understood that that is adulterous. <laughs> like, it's, nobody will tell you that's holy. That's so sweet. That's so beautiful. That's so faithful. One of the problems we have in Western civilization and society is that as long as I didn't hurt anybody, I didn't do anything wrong. As long as I didn't harm anybody, I didn't, I didn't commit a crime. But, but Torah doesn't really agree with that because I didn't harm or hurt anybody if I didn't believe in God or if I worshipped idols. I didn't hurt or, hurt or harm anybody if I blasphemed against God. Well, murder, that's the problem. But I will say, I didn't hurt or harm anybody if I killed a baby. It was just a baby. It was a fetus. It was anyway. Well, it was just a fetus. I didn't hurt or harm anybody if the person begged me, please pull the plug. I can't live anymore. It's too painful for me. I didn't hurt or harm. I did him a favor. And people will say, I didn't do anything wrong. My, my, my wife gave me permission. My husband gave me permission. I'm not an adul adulterer. I asked permission. Adultery is not wrong because I cheated behind a husband and wife's back. Adultery is wrong because it's a violation of the bond and the commitment of marriage, which ultimately is a commitment to Hashem. So Judaism does not believe that sexuality is an ugly thing, a bad thing, a horrible thing. In fact, uh, the Kohen Gadol was the holiest Jew who would have to enter the Holy of Holies, couldn't do so unless he was married. Only once in our history was there a person who was allowed to separate from his wife and was considered to be you know, an, a, a, on his own and that was the right thing, and that's Moshe Rabbeinu. But Moshe Rabbeinu is different. There's one Moshe Rabbeinu. Do you know that the high priest, if his wife were to die, Erev Yom Kippur, couldn't perform the service of Yom Kippur? This will sound crazy to you. But there was somebody waiting in case the high priest's wife would die that he should be able to remarry immediately. Or there was another priest, another high priest that would step in and take over of him. Because marriage is the holiest thing. There's no other mitzvah that we recite seven blessings over. There's no other mitzvah that the Torah gives so much attention to, lavishes so much attention on. Why? Because it's sacred. It's a divine idea. So not only is human life sacred, but human sexuality is sacred. The most powerful urge that God gave us, the urge through which we're able to procreate and bring the next generation into the world is also sacred, if we choose for it to be sacred. It doesn't mean sexuality is sacred in any form. <laughs> Think of it this way. Uh, last week was Pesach. We were eating matzah. If somebody would bring challah to the table, you'd be aghast. Challahs? He said, but it's Friday night. Friday night with the tzugazun. Don't we have challah on Friday? He said, yeah, we have, we have challah on Friday night, but that's on Friday. Now, now it's Pesach. What? I don't understand. This is bread and that's bread. So this rose a little. So this is flat. He said, all sexuality is good. No, that's not true. All sexuality is not holy, sanctified. There is divinely sa sanctioned 
and, and, and what God calls hallowed forms of sexuality, and they, namely marriage, and then that was just a violation of it. I know some people call me a Nazi for saying this. I don't, I don't really get that either, but, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what the Torah teaches. That's what the Torah, Torah wants us to kind of commit to and live by. Needless to say, sexual abuse is then one step beneath murder. In fact, the Torah says that to prevent a human being from being murdered, the moral thing to do is to kill the would-be murderer. The Torah also says that to prevent a woman from being raped, the would-be rapist should be killed as well. That doesn't mean that there's a capital punishment for rape. If the rape happened already, that's tragic, and there's no capital punishment for rape. But to prevent a woman from being robbed of her intimacy, you're allowed to kill the would-be attacker. So one, literally one step beneath murder is the idea of sexual abuse, which speaks volumes about the sexual abuse of minors, sexual abuse of people in power, like a president who abused a, an intern in his office. Actually, multiple presidents who did that. Or faith leaders who did that. Or people of power who had dominion over people who were young and vulnerable. Not even talking about children. It's, hor- it's horrible things. From a Torah perspective, to use that which is supposed to be sacred, that which is supposed to be so carefully handled, and because it's such a po- powerful and potent force to rob somebody of that, to abuse somebody of that, is considered literally only one step beneath murder itself. So somebody once asked me, how come the Torah doesn't comment on sexual abuse? I'm like, are you joking? The Torah doesn't comment on it? Do you even know the seven Noahide laws? Do you even know that sexual abuse is literally one step beneath? It's like, after Ritzicha, after murder, comes the concept of of Leisinov, to the account of, of, of deviant sexual behavior. Okay, so now I know that human life is sacred. I know human sexuality is sacred. What's the next thing that's going to be sacred? My possessions. Well, you could argue if God created the world, so God owns everything. And if God owns everything, how can you own anything? It's all God's world. So therefore, if I'm righteous and good and you're not, I'll take what's yours and give it to those who are needy. There was a famous guy who did that in the Middle Ages, or at least the stories they tell about him. Robin Hood. (laughs) Communism is like Robin Hood. Steal from the rich to give to the poor. The bourgeois, the capitalists, are selfish. All they care about is themselves. And they're needy people. So we'll take from those who need from those who have and give to those who need. So what does Torah have to say about that? That's called theft. That's what Torah has to say about it. That's theft. To take something that belongs to somebody else because you decided you want to do that is simply wrong. End of story. It's wrong. It's immoral. So what should we do? Let people be selfish? The answer would be no. Inspire them. Teach them righteousness. Teach them to be good. We're going to get to that soon. That's part of the codes, part of the responsibilities we have. So the notion, of course, of of, of do not steal, first and and foremost, acknowledges that there's a God. A person could say, "I, I have to live, I have to keep body and soul together, and therefore I have to steal. And we would say, one second, but if you believe in God, don't you believe that God could provide for you? Don't you believe that God could provide with you without you choosing to do something which is intrinsically wrong, which the Torah deems to be intrinsically wrong? It also means the notion of abusing, whether it's people's trust, whether it's, whether it's people's friendship, betrayal. These are all acts of theft. Taking something illegal from somebody else, taking something in a, in a, in a negative way that doesn't really belong to you. Ultimately, the concept of respecting the property and rights of others is all rooted in the notion of do not steal. And anybody who would take away the rights and property of others with the highest of ideals or greatest of justifications is still doing the wrong thing. Because the Torah says it's wrong. So we know we have to believe in God. Or we can't 
channel belief in an alien way. We know we should be respectful and not blasphemous. We understand that human life is sacred. We understand human sexuality is sacred. We understand that human property has to be respected. And it's a divinely given right for people to own things from their bodies to the homes they live in or the clothes they're wearing. So where do animals fit into all this? Did I steal from anybody if I eat an animal? Did I rob the animal of his life? Why didn't I? Did I murder the animal? Did I abuse the animal? I mean, he's dead. I'm eating him. So the Torah tells us that God does permit Noah to eat animals. What God does not permit Noah or any of his descendants to do is to torture animals. We have no right to be cruel towards any living thing. We can humanely kill something if there is a need for humanity. Basically, from a Torah perspective, there's this pyramid. And in the pyramid, there's what you would call a food chain. There's the mineral world. The mineral world is devoured by the vegetative world. The vegetation is devoured by the animals who in turn devour themselves to each other. And then the humanity is able to consume the animal world and ultimately, who does humanity serve? Hashem. So really and truly, when somebody ate well and as a result of that acted kindly and compassionately towards another or prayed or with fervor and devotion to God, not only did the person pray, but the roast beef or steak he ate was praying and doing a favor. The vegetation that was consumed by the animal is now praying or being kind and compassionate. And ultimately, the mineral world that fed the vegetative world is also part of this process. So what seems to be kind and compassionate by saying, oh, I wouldn't eat an animal, is perhaps robbing of the animal of its opportunity to serve God. When the animal's hide becomes a Sefer Torah, that's the greatest gift the animal could ever have received. That's the greatest satisfaction the animal could ever have received. God didn't give animals self-consciousness. They don't have family albums. They don't have family get-togethers. <laughs> they don't build fancy architecture, although the, the beaver builds a nice dam. They don't do things like that. Animals are created differently. The one thing we're not allowed to do is be cruel, ever. To be cruel to an animal, ultimately, is, is, a, is a, a violation of our bond with God. God put us in this world, la'avdo l'shamra, to be the world's caretaker. We're supposed to be the curator of the world and all its fullness, which includes taking care of our planet, includes taking care of animals, includes being kind and compassionate. In fact, there's a fascinating halacha about kaparas. Kaparas is this notion that we're gonna, we painlessly and quickly kill the chicken and then we take its meat and we feed it to the poor. And then the halacha says that in addition to doing that on Erev Yom Kippur, that the guts of the animal should be fed so other animals could eat. And then it says... Anybody who is merciful or compassionate will be the recipient of compassion from God. And it says, God is compassionate towards all of his creatures. So yes, we're allowed to kill that chicken. We're not allowed to torture the chicken, no. We're not allowed to hurt or harm the chicken. We can use the chicken for a higher purpose. The Torah says we could. We can't torture him. So, you know, the aboriginals really had this right. They never tortured animals. They killed animals. They used animals. They built their dwellings, their teepees out of the leather. They used everything from the sinews to the bone to the teeth. The tribes in Africa and the tribes who lived in North America and South America were all renowned for this. They used every nuance. They respected creation. They didn't waste things. To be wasteful, ultimately, is also an act of blasphemy. And to torture an animal is a horrific course of behavior. Hunting for sport is a repugnant thing. <laughs> it's horrific. Just killing animals 
for sport. It doesn't make you a murderer, but it makes you cruel. It makes you indifferent. It's a horrible thing to do. You hunt in order to eat, you have that right. A Jew has to trap the animal and slaughter him quickly and painlessly, which is kosher ritual slaughter. A Gentile doesn't have that obligation. He can use a high-powered rifle. He should try to kill the animal as quickly and as painlessly as possible. Killing animals for trophies? To kill an elephant for his tusks and then leave the elephant to rot? To kill a lion because it's fun and take a picture sitting on top? That's disgusting. That's repugnant. It's Hashem's world. It's a life. What are you taking the life for? I think it's okay to kill a cockroach if it's in your house. I don't see a reason to go killing all the cockroaches of the world. <laughs> I don't know. When I walk on the side of the like after it rains, I don't look to try to step on every worm I could. If they're in my house, I'm going to kill them. To be respectful towards all creatures. There's a story told of a chassid who saw his child throwing rocks at a cat. And he disciplined the child very severely. And I'll even not talk about this day. He spanked him. And then the little boy ran off hurt from what his father did to him. And he comes back home and he sees his father was sitting and crying with his hand over his face because he had to, he had to hit his child. And the lesson was so powerful. The child never forgot that he got hit. He never forgot that it moved his father to tears that he had to, he had to, he had to hit him. And he never again tortured an animal. So torturing animals is absolutely prohibited. It was once popular, and in some parts of the world it's still popular, to eat living animals. So that's the height of insensitivity, because it's fresh. You want to eat an animal that's fresh. You want to eat an animal that hasn't aged the least bit. So the, it was called tearing a limb off an animal. And this was a popular thing to do, a popular sport, to literally torture an animal for your own sensual pleasure, for your own palate. So the Torah says that's absolutely prohibited. But ultimately, by extension, to torture animals for no reason is simply wrong. And it goes against God's code. You, you have a perfect world. <laughs> it just, you have a world where people believe in God, their belief is channeled appropriately. You have a world where people are respectful towards God and ultimately, because of that, towards creation, towards people, the environment, and everything else in between. You have a world in which people respect human life to the nth degree whether this intelligent human life or severely retarded, God forbid, doesn't make a difference. A mongoloid, it's a human life. Human life is human life. Our society inherently understands this. Our society spends millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars a year keeping people alive. Our society understands that. Why our society doesn't see it as a contradiction to kill people just because they want to be killed is a mystery to me. It used to be when somebody wanted to commit suicide and jump off a building, they'd come with a fire net. To catch him. Why are you catching him for? That's what he wants to do. So his emotional pain, you don't care about this. Physical pain, that's it. Kill him. I said to somebody, to a doctor, I was arguing about this. I said, so tell me, doctors are going to have like um, revolvers strapped in out to their, to their sides and the hospital just blow patients' brains? He's like, are you crazy? I said, am I crazy? I said, no, are you crazy? <laughs> what do you think is the difference? Putting a bullet in somebody's head or putting poison into, in, 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 into the, uh, to the IV? So we have a world in which human life is properly respected. We have a world in which sexuality is treated with kid gloves instead of the cheap, gaudy, sleazy way that it's regarded today. We have a world in which people respect the property of others and don't steal, maybe inspire people to be charitable, kind and considerate and compassionate, but not to make their own decisions of taking things illegally. We have a world that's kind to animals. So what's the one thing we're missing? The one thing we're missing is that human beings need to have laws to live by. God didn't tell us exactly how we should live. Actually, He did tell the Jewish people exactly how they should live, and those mitzvahs are binding upon us. But He didn't tell Noah, He didn't tell Adam and Eve, He didn't tell humanity He's exactly how you should live. He said, but you should have laws. Every society has an obligation to police itself. Every society has an obligation to create a lawful society so that it's not a wild west, so that it's not a jungle gone crazy. And this is a decidedly positive mitzvah. A mitzvah of shaftim, of maintaining justice. A mitzvah of respecting the law. A society 
in which justice is perverted, in which the ju judicial system does not operate with an indifference to race, creed, and color is a failed society. A society where people are treated differently by the law because of the color of their skin, because of the weight of their pocketbook, because of the level of their education is a, is a, is a, 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 a fraught and destructive society. It's a society that goes against the will of Hashem. The society, the laws that we have, have to be meted out equally. Nobody is above the law. Everybody has to live lawfully. And we have to comport ourselves in accordance with a system of law. And there's always going to be evil people. That's just the way it is. So what do we need besides having laws? We need law enforcement. We'll always need armies. We'll always need police forces. We'll always need security agencies. But they have to make sure that the law is carried out and that the law is respected and that those who break the law will be appropriately prosecuted. A society that has no courts, no laws, no fairness, no compromise, no sense of justice is a society that will, as it has in the past, in the end, collapse and fail. Well, that's of no hard laws. So now you know the seven ochas, they, they make sense. So let's talk about communicating this. I didn't realize it would take us so long. We'll talk about communicating. How are you going to communicate this? So the first thing is, when you're, when, you, when you're communicating these laws, now that you understand them, it can make sense. You can have a conversation with somebody about them. You have to connect with people. When I'm in the plane, I'm usually either studying or reviewing my emails. Like we're doing things. It's very hard to read in a car. It's very hard to, you know, most people read, they get, they get dizzy. So you're in a car, and also you're, you're with somebody, this person's driving you. It's perfectly normal to strike up a conversation. It's respectful, in fact. Most of my seven Noah High Laws encounters are in, are in the taxis. So you're sitting in a taxi, you say hi to the person. You say, how are you? Inquire about the person. Where are you from? Do you like driving a taxi? You'd be surprised how few people start conversations with cab drivers and how much they appreciate it. From my experience, almost to a point, almost to a fault, people appreciate being asked. They want to hear somebody cares about them. Don't tell them about yourself. Ask them about themselves. So I spend the first five minutes creating a relationship with the driver, whoever he or she is, where they're from, what they like. If they ask me where I'm from, I'll tell them. Is it, is, how long have you been driving a cab for? Do you like driving a cab? Do you miss your host country? A lot of times they're immigrants. At a certain point, I, I, I say, out of curiosity, do you, are you a person of faith? You, and interestingly, 94% of the people will say yes. Yeah, I, I believe this or believe that. Or many people tell me, well, I, I'm spiritual but not religious. And I say, yeah. I go, yeah, me too. And they look at me, usually start laughing. And they go, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, aren't you a rabbi or something? I'm like, I say, yeah, but I'm, ju I'm just spiritual. Not. And you make a few light jokes of being spiritual and not religious or whatever and talk about religion. And... and um, I say to them, did you know that there's like an ancient religious code that predates all religions, all faith systems? And they go, really? I said, yeah, it's like 5,778 years old. I said, you're kidding. Really? I said, yeah, I can tell you about it. Are you interested? So this is not, don't worry, I'm not trying to convert you. So this is not, this is, this is, and you start to talk about these things. But not like say, rule, rule one, rule two, rule three, you throw rules at them. Nobody wants to have any rules thrown at them. But if you talk about this, as we talked about it, and the things that I've shared with you over the last hour and a half, you can pick and choose whatever detail it is, whatever nuance it is. The more you talk about it, things will come, will illuminate, will be more clear to you or less clear to you. But the point is you're conveying something that makes sense to you. You're conveying something which you appreciate, which you understand. And you talk about these things. And invariably, the results are magnificent. I've had people get out of taxis and hug me. People, one, one woman told me this is the best taxi ride she's ever had in her life. She was the driver. <laughs> she drives a taxi. All day. I've never had such a good taxi ride in my life, she says. I enjoyed this half hour so much. I'm so happy. I got to do something good. This is what they ever wanted us to do. Imagine if every observant yid, yid who's spiritually minded or inclined to think, would just do this. Just, just do this. Every person you meet. So you do it five times a year, ten times a year, twenty, thirty, forty times a year. Think of the numbers. Think of how many people would hear about this. Think of eventually the crisscrossing that starts to take place. This is really the meaning of making a world of goodness. And if nothing else, 
we're elevating the conversation. I cannot tell you how many times taxi drivers have said to me, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google this. Or I'm going to continue this conversation with somebody else. And that's, that's the most amazing thing to hear. So if you understand this, if you could convey it in a language that makes sense to them, if you, if you can build a relationship or reach out and connect with somebody, invariably you have the opportunity to be part of a global revolution of making a world of goodness, of catalyzing world peace by hastening and accelerating the coming of Mashiach, Ben Heira, will be Amen or Amen. What were the words you used to initiate this conversation? To, to describe and initiate that first sentence about, did you know there were... Um, I, 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 I don't think I ever say the same thing twice, but your, your question, what, 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 would, what would I say? Yeah. It depends on somebody's response. But after having already started a conversation, after having a relationship, I would say something like, uh, do you know that like the oldest faith or faith system or faith idea predates all religions? Do you know that? Did you know that it's, there's a code that's 5,778 years old? That's people intriguing, really? Is that documented? I said, yeah. And it's like, or sometimes I'll say to somebody, do you read the Bible ever? So I, I don't go there. I say, yeah, okay, do you read the Bible ever? And they'll like chuckle, maybe, yeah, maybe no. I said, remember that story about Noah? This is a lot of times I do. Remember that story about Noah? Mm-hmm. And they'll go like, yeah, that's the guy with the boat. I said, well, it's more like a barge because the boat's built. It gets from one place to the next. Place. Yeah, with the animals. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a simple question because he's like a pretty smart person. If God never told them what he expected of them, right, why did he punish them? And they're like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I said, see, you think the whole Bible makes no sense? And they go, I don't know. I said, didn't God have to? Oh, yeah, he did. He did the Ten Commandments. I mean, Ten Commandments. That's 27 generations later. You've got to be kidding. That's, that's 17 generations after Noah. It can't be the Ten Commandments. I said, oh, you're right. Yeah, that's comes in. How, how could that be? So by now, they're actually interested. They want to know the answer to the question. So at that point, you know, like uh, you pick up the conversation from there. With a smile and with friendship and with openness, without preaching, without talking down, it's possible to influence people in a positive way.